All right, hello everyone. Hope you are all doing well. This is going to be a follow-up video that goes along with uh, the previous published video that I made that was about Flask and MongoDB. Um, in the previous video, we were talking about using Flask and MongoDB to create a user authentication system to store uh, passwords according to best practices with hashes um, and how to properly implement that in Python code in a Flask web server so that you are storing your user accounts in accordance with uh, the best practices. So if you uh, didn't watch that and you want some background on the project that I'll be working with in this video, then I would encourage you to go back and watch uh, that um, prior video, uh, at least um, maybe the tail end of it, if you want to just see what we ended up with. Um, but also it'd be nice, uh, truthfully, if you catch the whole thing, because you'll be able to see um, you write this app from the ground up, so you'll have a really good understanding of everything that is going on inside of it. Um, with that being said, today we're going to talk about a couple of things um, which I found recently in this really great talk on YouTube. Uh, so I'm going to start with a recommendation, uh, which is this talk from NDC Oslo 2024. Um, I'll put the link to this in the description of the video. I also have the link to it in a file which is in the repo, uh, and the repo will also be linked in the video. So there's a couple of ways you can get to this um, this video. This is from NDC Oslo, uh, Seven Things About API Security by Felipe de Ryuk. Um, this is really good. It's on the longer side, almost an hour, um, but it's got a lot of good information if you are a person creating APIs. There's lots of information about best practices and things. Uh, and some good examples of why the best practices are the best practices. Um, we're going to look at one of the things that Felipe talks about in that video, but there are still a handful of others that we won't talk about today. So uh, that's another one I would encourage you to go and watch that. It was a really, really great talk. Um, I took a lot of inspiration from it, and that's basically my inspiration for making this video, was wanting to practice some of the stuff um, that was mentioned in that video and just record my own video. Uh, with my own attempt at explaining it uh, as well. Um, so here we are. Um, jumping right in uh, with one of the kind of core concepts that goes along with what we're going to be talking about. Um, the place where we're going to end up is, as a, a bit of a preview here, we're trying to end up talking about timing attacks. But before we do that, we're actually going to talk about what I call the lowest hanging fruit, uh, which is a similar uh, concept. And I think thinking about it this way first, um, will help us understand why it's problematic and uh, how the timing attack ultimately gets used against the web application. So um, the, the type of vulnerability that we're dealing with here is a type of vulnerability that can allow uh, an attacker, a malicious user, to try and figure out which user accounts are valid within the system. Um, and this lowest hanging fruit, I'm not going to necessarily read it word for word here. I'll leave it on the screen for a bit. You can pause if you want to read uh, what I wrote, but I'll basically try to paraphrase um, what's written here, which is basically if your web application returns a different error message in different cases for failed login attempts, like whenever a user is making a login attempt, um, there are a couple of different possible outcomes, right? Like the user login attempt could succeed. You know, they could provide a valid username and a valid password, uh, and then they're going to get logged in and everything's good to go. Um, that's one possibility. Another possibility is the user provides a, uh, a real username that does exist in the system, but they provide an incorrect password. Okay, so in that possibility, they've given us a good username, but a bad password. Uh, and then, you know, a third possibility could be they give us a bad username, a username that does not exist in our database. Uh, and then we don't necessarily care about the password they gave us because it doesn't belong to any of our users, um, or at least we presume it doesn't. Or in any case, they didn't attempt to log into a user that we actually know about. Um, so those are like three different kind of scenarios. And you might think it's a good idea to give some descriptive error messages where you could say in the case that the user doesn't exist, maybe you would return an error message that says, hey, the user doesn't exist. Or in the case where the password is invalid, maybe you return an error message that says password invalid. Um, and this is actually not the best practice. Uh, it's nice during development potentially because it allows you to figure out maybe if your code's working right and what the actual root problem was. But in the real world, in production, in practice, deployed on the internet, this is bad because this allows attackers to gain additional information. They can now just guess usernames, whether it's 
at random or uh, stolen from you know data breaches, um, they can just grab those lists of username from all those data breaches out on the dark web. They can brute force that, send all those usernames to your server one at a time. And if you're giving them different responses, they're going to be able to tell which users are actually real users and which ones aren't. Because the ones that say, you know, password invalid, those ones are going to be valid users, which they can then use to refine their list down to only user accounts that are valid. So they can then start trying to brute force the passwords of those uh, user accounts if they so choose. So this is kind of the core idea of this problem is this inconsistent observable behavior for these different um, you know possible outcomes to the login attempt. Um, this is kind of the easiest way to visualize it is if you just had a nice clean error message that tells you exactly what the problem is, you know, user doesn't exist or password was invalid. Um, but luckily we've gotten to a point where lots of web systems no longer do this they 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 don't do this because this is bad like we just talked about and instead what you see more typically these days uh, which is good which is better is uh, if you provide uh, a bad username or a bad password you're going to get back the same error message so it's going to be something generic if you put in um, you know, a username and a password, then the server is just, and, and, and for whatever reason that didn't work, so whether the username was not real or whether the username was real but the password was wrong, in both of those cases, the server is gonna return to you the exact same error message, something generic like username or password is invalid. Um, so this is good. This is kind of the solution to the problem described here. Now, slightly higher fruit in this uh, tree here are the timing attacks. So timing attacks are an attempt at this exact same concept to glean information about whether or not a user exists within the, uh, within the system. Um, this is discussed in Felipe's talk here at, at 2040. So if you, uh, for whatever reason, wanna, wanna link up with the exact part of the video where uh, Felipe is talking about this stuff, um, it's right or, it starts right around uh, 20 minutes and 40 seconds. Um, be warned, because uh, if you if you miss the beginning of the video, then you'll you'll miss the warning that's in the video, and it and it happens to come right after this. Um, in Oslo, when this was recorded, there is there was a national um, broadcast, a national emergency broadcast testing. So, uh, shortly into this video, if you start watching it at this timestamp, um, I believe it is shortly into it after this, y there will be a bunch of buzzers and stuff going off. It quiets down after a minute or two. Uh, but just you know, be warned if you got earbuds or anything and you're trying to watch this, uh, be ready for that. If you watch the whole thing through, then Felipe will warn you at the beginning, um, so you don't have to rely on my warning, uh, which again, I would encourage you to watch the whole thing because it's really, really great. So in a timing attack, the idea here is the same, except for this is an attempt to exploit a server which actually is using the best practices here. It's returning a generic message, so we're not able uh, you know, to discern whether or not the user exists based on just the message. And if we do look back at the application, which we wrote in the prior video, if we look at our login view right here, um, inside the post method, we get the incoming username from the request form. We get the incoming password from the request form. We connect up with the database. We get the user's collection. We attempt to look up the user in the database. And if that user is not in the database right here, it says if found user is none, we're going to raise a value error right there. So if we, uh, if the user has given us a username, remember we took this from the front end, from the form, if the username that was provided to us is not in our database, then this line of code right here is going to raise this value error right here. So when that happens, it's going to get caught uh, you know, accepted by this block right here. So if that value error is raised, we're going to jump down here. We're going to return this error message, invalid username or password. Okay, so that's one branch is invalid username, you know, username that doesn't exist. We end up returning this error right here. If we continue on a little bit, if we assume that we found a valid user, the next thing we're going to do is if found user check password against the incoming password. If that succeeds, we log in the user, we redirect to the private page or the dashboard or whatever. Else, if that fails, if the password was incorrect, again, we return an error message to the user and it is indeed, we can see the exact same message here. So you can see that the app that we've written here is not vulnerable in this way. Um, you know, it is following the best practices of returning the same error message no matter what, but it turns out that it is actually vulnerable to these timing attacks the way it's been written. 
And the core idea of these timing attacks is that even though we're returning the same message, there might still be some observable difference in those responses, and in particular in the response timings. Um, if we imagine a scenario where maybe when you submit a username and a password, um, you know, you could imagine the logic being written such that if the username doesn't exist, that function might return the error message earlier um, than if the user does exist and it actually goes on to check the password. And maybe if, uh, you know, a malicious user or an attacker was um, attempting to log into the site and they were taking, you know, watching very closely how long those responses were taking, um, they might be able to see a pattern start to emerge where maybe when you submit uh, an invalid username, a username that doesn't exist, you might get a response um, faster than if you submit a username that does exist. Uh, and the likely reason for that is the code might be written pretty much exactly how this code here is written, which again, summarizing, we get the input from the form, we get both username and password, we connect up with the database, we get the collection, we look up the user object from our database. If we failed that lookup, if the user doesn't exist, we return the error right here. If the user does exist, if this succeeded, then we check the password. As part of checking the, has the, the password, we're gonna be generating the hash from this incoming password that the user typed in when they tried to log in, okay? And generating that hash in order to do this check inside of here, generating, and, and we, can, we can click through if we want, check password, it's actually just calling check password hash, which of course comes from that uh, work zug. Uh, and again, if, if any of this is new to you or, or you want a little bit deeper, again, go back to the previous videos is when I wrote all this stuff so you can kind of see from the ground up how this stuff works together. Um, but in there, it's using that work zug, it's checking the password, and as part of that process, it's gonna be hashing this incoming password and that hashing process actually takes a little bit of time. Uh, you know, it takes more time than, than lots of other things that the computer does. So, um, you know, it's likely that if the code is written in this way where the user lookup is attempted and then if it fails, we immediately return, whereas if it succeeds, we go and do a password check, which includes a, a hashing of that incoming password, that hashing is gonna take some extra time, whereas the lack of any hashing occurring right here means this one is likely to go faster. This response is probably gonna get returned quicker than this response here, um, you know, because it, the computer, the server will have had to spend some time hashing that password there. Um, so let's jump back to here real fast and then we'll get into kind of a hands-on demonstration of this and then we'll get into kind of the easiest way to fix this, although perhaps maybe not the most efficient, but like one easy way that you could fix it. Okay, so we've seen uh, what a timing attack is. We've seen that R code is likely vulnerable to it. So let's go ahead and actually validate that. In order to do so, I'm gonna use Burp Suite, uh, which is also a tool that Felipe uses in, uh, in the talk there, although uh, Felipe is a, a professional in this field and has the professional version of the software, which I do not. I have the free version, uh, but it works mostly the same, so we can use it for this. So we need to do a few things. We wanna go to proxy. We can turn intercept on, we can come back to here. We can hope that this will load or actually not load because it's getting intercepted. Uh, we can forward that. So that's gonna be over on HTTP history now. We can jump back to intercept for one second and we want to just log in with some bogus data pretty much. So let's just slam in some stuff here. It doesn't really matter what it is. Just hammer some keys, get a, get a post going here. Uh, we are on intercept, so we're gonna take that. We're gonna forward it. Over in HTTP history now, we have the get request where we loaded the login page. We have the post request where we actually submitted the attempt to log in. So in this case, you know, again, I just kind of slammed the keyboard a little bit there. So we've just got some random letters and we can see the response tells us we got an invalid username or password. Okay, so now we're gonna take this request. We're gonna send it over to intruder. Uh, and again, this is not meant to be a, a necessarily like an all encompassing tutorial on Burp Suite. If you haven't used Burp Suite, before, I'm gonna be going through this kind of quick. Um, this is not meant to be necessarily explaining how to do this in Burp Suite. There are probably good, uh, better, better videos for that out there. I'm mostly interested in just explaining the concept, showing an example of it, and then showing how we can fix it in that specific 
uh, application that we created in the prior video. So uh, check out if you do if you are interested in this stuff. Um, you know you can get Burp Suite Community Edition. Like I said, it is free. If you want to use it, you can. There are lots of great resources out there for learning how to use it. It is a bit daunting because it's got loads and loads of different capabilities. Uh, it can do all kinds of stuff. So um, yeah, be warned, it's a bit a bit in depth. Uh, you know, kind of like Photoshop or any other complex software. It's got a bit of a learning curve. Um, but yeah, this this video won't be teaching you too much about it, but you could follow along if you wanted to. Anyway, I'll stop yapping now. So we're over in Intruder. We sent our post request there. We're going to turn the username right here into a variable by doing this add squirrely thing. Uh, we can just leave the password the same. That's fine. We're going to set up some payloads. So we basically, uh, we can we want a couple of random ones, and then we want one real one. And I've noticed this is doing this, so I'm just going to empty a blank one and then... It's still not going to let me type, actually, so I'm going to clear. It's still not going to let me type. Okay, so I'm going to actually paste the first one, maybe? Paste. Now can I type? There we go. Okay, so now I can type. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Something's weird with the interface there. We're going to put in a couple of these things, just slam in some random stuff here. And again, this would be, you know, ordinarily this would be like either randomly generated or more likely this would be like a data dump, right? They're going to pull, you know, thousands or millions of usernames from some past data dumps at different services uh, or companies or whatever. Okay, I'm just going to put in some random ones, though, as an example, and we'll just stick with about 10 or however many that is. So we've got some, we've got some payloads in our list. We do want to go to the resource pool. We want to create a resource pool. We can call it whatever we want. I'm going to call it timing. We want it to be maximum concurrent request one, although I'm not sure if that matters for the free version anyway. It's already throttled. Maybe it does that. I don't know. But uh, these are the steps that Felipe takes in the video, uh, and I have followed those and had success with them. So we're going to create that resource pool set it to maximum concurrent request one because we want to get our timings independent, right? We want to send one username, time how long it took, and then send the next one, time how long it took, send the next one, time how long it took, so on and so forth. We don't want to be, you know, sending a bunch of them all at the same time. Then they might be interfering with each other and maybe the server, uh, you know, can't handle them all at once. And so maybe some take longer because they just have to wait on others or whatever. We want to get all of that out the window, we want to just be worried about each one individually, so we'll have a concurrent requests maximum of one. Um, and we're pretty much ready now. We have our position, we have our payloads, we have our pool, so we can start. Um, you know, fair warning, obviously, Burp Suite is like a hacking utility, right? So hacking things that you don't have authorization for, hacking things that you don't have permission to is obviously illegal in lots of parts of the world, so don't hack things that you don't have permission to. Don't use burp suite on things you don't have permission to um you know obviously i think that goes without saying but also should be said no matter what anyway uh so just bear that in mind you know be responsible with the with the tool treat it with the respect uh that it deserves if you do start playing with it uh, and don't do anything illegal um okay so this is the response this is the results of our attack and what we can see we have uh, each one of those payloads that was sent to the server Every one of them got a 200 OK status response, and they will have all just gotten the response that says invalid username or password. But the interesting bit about this is the response received column here. This is the time that it took for that response to get received. So from the time we sent the request until the time we got the response, for this username right here, it was 106 milliseconds. But for all of these ones down here, it was just like three milliseconds up to about 13 milliseconds. Uh, so much, much faster. This one right here took, you know, about 10 times as long as most of these other ones here. You know, 106 milliseconds is still really, really fast. But, you know, 13 milliseconds and three milliseconds, these are way, way faster orders of magnitude or, you know, at least multiple times, almost 10 times faster in this case. So what this means is that uh, from an attacker's perspective, they can now start to see this pattern right here. They can say, you know, these ones right here, these are coming back almost instantaneously, whereas this one right here, the server seems to have taken some extra time to process that one. And so we can kind of make a educated guess that that extra time, you know, if we're, if we're putting our attacker hat on, we can kind of make an educated guess that that extra time was used in order to compute the hash of the password. Uh, and then if the logic is written in that flawed way where 
um, you know, the username not existing returns without hashing a password or without taking up any additional time, then we will get to the scenario where the valid username takes longer. This one took 106 milliseconds. The others took less than 13, so about 10 times. We can kind of tell, you know, this one is probably a valid username. All the rest of these went super fast. These are probably not valid usernames. Okay, so that's how, uh, that is what a timing attack vulnerability is. That's how this app is vulnerable to it. And this is a demonstration um, showing that this app is vulnerable to it, showing that we found the valid username. From our attacker perspective, you know, we're assuming that this was a, a stolen list of usernames or whatever. We didn't know which ones actually had accounts on this system, and now we do. We have re refined our list. We've narrowed it down to only the ones that are actually valid accounts, which is, um, you know, better for us as an attacker if we want to try to break into those accounts. Uh, but obviously worse for us as a developer, if we don't want to let people break into accounts. Okay, uh, does not want to save for some reason, which is a little bit odd. Anyway, so let's get back into the code here, login. So the easiest way we can solve this, uh, you know, probably not the most efficient, but the easiest way we can solve this is in the case when there was a user not found, which in our code right here is when this exception is raised. In that case, when we don't find a valid user, we need to use up some extra time. Uh, and in fact, what we really want to do is we want to use up pretty much the same amount of time that this password hash is going to take. Um, you know, we could we could like time it and then we could put like a time dot sleep here and put in, you know, zero point whatever measures out to be how, you know, about how long that takes. Um, you know, an easier way though, we can actually just compute a hash, right? We could just say, you know, underscore, we're gonna create a variable that we don't really care about, uh, equals, we can just say, um, generate password hash. Again, that's imported from WorkZerg, right? WorkZerg security, generate password hash. We can just call that. We could pass in anything, you know, we could go ahead and just pass in the, the whatever came from the user, whatever they sent in the form. We could generate a random string. We could give it, you know, a regular, hard-coded string, I guess, probably that's the worst option, but um, you know, realistically, we could give it pretty much anything here as long as we're actually gonna spend some time generating a hash. Uh, okay, so just adding that one line, whenever we caught that value error saying that the user did not exist, now we will go ahead and actually generate a hash that we're just gonna basically throw away before we return our message. That means that whether or not a user actually was existing, whether or not the, the username that was passed in represents a valid user in our database or not, we are going to generate a password hash. If the user was valid, we're going to generate it here. If the user was not valid, we're going to generate it here. In both cases, we assume it's going to take about the same amount of time, which means that now these return times are actually going to be a lot closer together. Uh, so let's save this. Uh, luckily, this one did actually save, which is good. We can restart it. And then we can try this exact same thing again. If we just close out of the old results, um, and we can basically rerun the exact same attack. Click this thing again, because I don't pay for this. Click back to here. Okay. And now what do we see here? Response received. We're way more clumped together, right? We don't like, they're not exactly the same. You know, there is still a range, but the range is way tighter, right? We don't have anything that's like 10 times as much. In fact, we don't even have anything that's two times as much. Uh, the smallest one was 66 milliseconds. The largest one was 88 milliseconds. You know, there's only 22 milliseconds of difference in between there, which is a very, very minuscule amount. Um, and importantly, when we compare the two together, they're relatively close, right? They're not, one is not a multiple of the other. You know, we're not 10 times more or five times more, you know, again, or even two times more. Um, you know, we're, we're a small fraction percentage more instead. Um, and in this case, it turns out the username that's actually real took 79 milliseconds, which in this case actually happens to be right in the middle of that pack, which is perfect because what that means is now from the attacker's perspective, they can no longer tell which one of these usernames is actually valid, if any, right? Because all these responses took the same time. They no longer can count on that timing to be able to say, oh, well, you know, this username, it looks like it took extra time and that's probably because it generated a hash. No, see now 
All of them take mostly the same time, therefore we no longer have observable information that tells us um, you know, the state, the, the outcome of this login attempt. Whereas before, technically that timing was giving it away a little bit. We did good in that we weren't giving it away with the error message, but we didn't do so good in that we were giving it away because of the timing. Uh, now that we are generating this hash and just throwing it away, that's using up some extra time. So now we are no longer vulnerable to that same problem. All right. I think that's pretty much it for this one. Uh, it's much shorter than the, the prior video, but that's really all I wanted to do with this one was just introduce the talk, um, tell you that you should really go watch it because, it, uh, you know, once again, it's really great. Um, explain the concepts of the timing attack, which I think we did pretty well, uh, show you that in action with Burp Suite, and then show you kind of the, the easiest possible way to fix it, which is just, again, you know, create a, create a hash and throw it away. Uh, just spend some, spend some extra time uh, to do that. And by creating a hash, we can ensure that we're going to spend about the same amount of time because we know that generate hash is happening inside of here as well. All right, that's it for this one. Uh, if you found this useful, um, then please uh, feel free to, to, to like or comment, um, you know, thumbs up, that kind of stuff is always great. Um, thank you for watching. I hope you have a good uh, rest of your day and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I will catch you later. Bye.